Thank you, Jeevan. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with, with uh, all of you. And uh, I, I think Jeevan mentioned that the topic that we all have today is uh, applying AI and analytics to determine consumer behavior in the uh, digital era. Now, uh, before I get started, uh, I am sure that we have many members in the audience who have already attended a few conferences or seminars on this topic. So why is it that the topic continues to be so interesting? Uh, I really think that it's because uh, of a couple of reasons. Uh, first is if you were to ask any senior technology person what technologies they are engaged in implementing, the response you'll probably get will definitely include AI or analytics. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, a recent survey conducted by Gartner of CIOs globally, they found that, well, they asked the question, they asked the CIOs to mention what they thought would be the most game-changing technology that they can think of over the next few years. And in the responses, we find that AI actually came out first, with 26% of the CIOs speaking that. The second they chose was analytics, uh, with 24% of the CIOs asking for it. And uh, cloud came in third, with 11%. Uh, may I request that uh, anyone not speaking can go on mute? I think we have a little disturbance and it, yeah, that's much better. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so I was saying other than these three, all the other technologies that we all spend our time on, the RPA, the blockchain, the immersive technologies, and so many other things, all of them were much lower in the list. So AI analytics is still top of the mind. Um, so that's one reason. And uh, I also want to venture a guess as to what would be the second reason. And that is that AI and analytics, they propose to be able to actually extract from the data real information. They are able to deduce patterns of customer behavior. They are able to extract knowledge, knowledge of how the customer is going to choose, what products he's going to choose and uh, almost to the point of being wisdom. I mean wisdom in terms of the context of knowing exactly where the customer is, what time it is, and uh, we were talking earlier in a session, actually his mood itself. Now, any technology that has got such lofty goals, it is likely to have its contours changing every time you review it, every time you look at it. Because on the one side, there is a fair amount of funding going into this technology, which is making it more mature, more easy to implement, get better results. And on the other hand, you have all of us, the implementers, who are learning to do this better. We're learning to understand where this thing can be effectively used um, and how to get some good results. So it really is an ongoing learning process. And therefore, we are really fortunate to have this experienced panel of uh, technology professionals here with us to help us unravel and deduce the mysteries of uh, AI and analytics. So with this, we'll get started. And I think it would be appropriate to first just all of us get to some kind of understanding of what really uh, analytics is, is all about. You know, we use terms AI, ML, analytics, does it all mean the same things or uh, are they inter interchangeable or, or do they have specific meanings? And I'd like to start off by asking Sarat to please try to sort of give us some understanding of that. Thanks, Aruna. Um, and thanks for the uh, brilliant intro. Um, very insightful. Um, the way I look at it is um, I think uh, if we go back maybe a few years back, uh, relationships and customer relationships were all based on people knowing each other. Um, now, when the number of customers increased, and uh, can you just give me a minute? I'm sorry, uh, I have to break. I'm sorry. Uh, 
It's okay. So with uh, the number of customers that um, uh, we are handling and uh, we are serving being a very large, this thing, uh, over the last uh, decade or maybe uh, uh, one and a half decades, we have used computerization in one form or the other to be able to understand who our customers are. Um, and at the scales that we were operating, possibly it was okay for us to look at all the customer data, transactional data, various other aspects and analyze it and categorize it humanly. So what we were looking at was there was data and there was some amount of analysis and information that we were extracting based on tools that we had at that point in time, and then applying our human intelligence to be able to derive insights and then take actions um, as human beings, as business owners to improve our business, improve the customer experience, so on and so forth. For me, analyzing the past data and coming up with insights and then taking uh, human driven uh, actions uh, with a lot of human insights is what I would look at as data analytics. It is about visualizing the past data. It is about looking for trends in the past data and then interpreting them with our human intelligence experience and then taking some actions. And uh, that's how I would look at as uh, data analytics. But now with a lot more data being captured and with uh, the quantum of the data itself being very varied, right? Uh, so one, the value, sorry, the count of uh, uh, data points that we are able to capture is very large. And the variety of data points that we are capturing is also increasing drastically. And uh, I believe at some level, this becomes slightly difficult for humans to be able to do this kind of data analytics and come up with predictive analytics or any other kind of uh, solutions by themselves. I think this is where machine learning has come in. Machine learning is about statistical methods, statistical models that we apply. And we are able to predict something for the future, categorize, be able to create recommendations of action, so on and so forth, based on the insights that the system with statistical uh, uh, algorithms is able to uh, bring in. And that I think is what I look at as machine learning, where we are providing data, there is well-proven statistical models the data models are injected by the people. And based on that, the machine is able to take some kind of um, um, decisions or recommendations, provide recommendations. AI for me is taking it one level further, where we're not necessarily saying that the data <clears throat> is class, uh, data is provided by um, uh, human beings, the models are provided by human beings, but all the data is dumped right in there. And the AI models are able to actually sift through the data the data models and come up with their own mechanisms based on feedback loops and auto learning that they are able to come with the AI algorithms are able to come with uh, new patterns, which a human being might not have been able to uh, identify. It also is a situation of opportunity where an AI algorithm could be used not only for structured data that we have been, I have been talking about until now, but also semi structured data and unstructured data too. For example, if I have to do KYC uh, document OCRs and stuff like that, uh, or validate KYC based on some images that I'm capturing, th this is very unstructured data. Now to be able to extract that, do validations on it and others is neither data analytics nor machine learning, but it is artificial intelligence in my mind. And uh, that's how I differentiate data, uh, data analytics, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I would, uh, like we were talking in the pre-session, um, artificial intelligence, for example, could be giving me insights on, um, let us say, somebody sending me a mail and I find the sentiment analysis. That's something that we can do uh, at some level with machine learning too. But when we are talking, being able to, this is completely unstructured data, being able to identify what am I talking and what is my mood at this point in time is something that an AI system would be able to deliver and uh, hence, it is a much stronger tool uh, that um, uh, we could use to understand our customers and uh, be able to deliver uh, value for our customers. That's how I uh, look at these three models. Uh, I hope um, any other inputs would be uh, something that I definitely learn from. Thank you, Sarat. That gives us some, some, uh, some clarity and boundaries between these different terms. So taking this and building further, my question next is to Rupreet. I'm going to say, uh, Rupreet, you know, Sarath explained that
that machine language is probably where the human being provides the model or the algorithm. AI is where you just give it data and say, detect your own model, detect your own pattern and, and take it forward. So Rupit, what do you think? In your view, this machine language and AI, do you really think of it as, as a um, an algorithm that the business has to analytically understand and verify before he takes it live? Or do you see it as a black box, something that AI has given you that this is the model, now go forward and, and use it. So you just test the results and take it forward. So are you seeing it more, you know, as a transparent algorithm or a black box? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Aruna, for this great question, because uh, as we have advanced uh, in artificial intelligence applications, I think there has been surge of, uh, you know, algorithm that uh, can perceive, learn, decide and then act on their own. Uh, and here comes an era of explainability AI where a human intervention is absolutely needed to actually validate the outcomes of the algorithm. So just let, let me go a bit deeper here. Uh, I think the traditional way of AI, uh, you know, we have training data, there's an ML process that run on, so on top of it. And then we have, uh, you know, a model that actually defines what is the action and decision that uh, needs to be taken. But with the intervention of human, uh, and we define it as explainability AI, there's an interface that is created after uh, the machine learning, you know, uh, uh, gives a path to actually validate whether that outcome is actually relevant or not. And then actually, you know, change that outcome or the path also if that is needed. So, so uh, I would say, and I'll, I'll actually give you an example why this is very critical, okay, the transparency of the AI models, uh, the credit scoring, just to give you a very simple example. Um, based on the data, you know, the algorithms and AI models are crafted in, I think, in every financial institution to actually define a credit score. But it's completely disrupted with the pandemic that has come, right? In the COVID-19, uh, people are, you know, they, they must be like rich and they must not be taking any loans and all, but now they've become defaulters. The model are, are not going to actually predict those kind of, uh, I think, pandemic uh, input with variables. So with that, I think the transparency has become much more relevant and the human intervention is needed. But on the flip side, I'll also give you a very different outcome here, okay? Uh, the bias and the AI ethics, because of the two reasons, I think the most critical reasons human intervention was needed, okay, because the algorithms were actually going towards bias and they were questioning the ethics also. And uh, so that is also getting questionable by the intervention of human because human can be also biased. So, okay, so that how, how much extreme do you want to go with explainability? That is also very critical. So, and another point is, uh, ex how do you define explainability, right? So, do you want to expose the algorithms? Do you want to expose the correlations between the input and the output? Or do you actually want to expose how the model got trained on the data set? Uh, it's, it's very different uh, when you actually expose the explainability AI to a particular type of user. It can be you know, given to a developer or it can be given to an end customer. They may actually perceive ex explainability AI in a very different sense. So I would say, you know, you, we need to actually create a balance between how much transparency we need with the human validation and how much black box you want to create with the and, and depend on the technology. And at the end of the day, um, the accountability and audit, auditability still resides with the organization's people. And so technology is still an enabler. We should just understand this. Great. Thank you. I think that starts to make it a little bit clearer, more transparent to us, so to speak. Okay, so, so now that we do understand what it is, and even we can see that even experienced technology professionals, um, you know, keep grappling with the difference in the different terms and, you know, how transparent it should be. And you said it really has to be a balance. So how do you actually take it into an organization where you have professionals who are not technology uh, sort of uh, focused, the business people, the operations people, you have to eventually sponsor your projects, right? So how do you uh, sort of uh, educate them and then uh, uh, introduce uh, AI in, into the organization? Rupert, tell me what you have seen in this area. There are a couple of points there, okay? So, um, you know, I think the implementation of an AI initiative Okay, it's basically 10 to 20% that the model is getting created, but I think the 70-80% is basically on the adoption. And when I say adoption, 
uh, it's both how do you adopt the AI model and second is how a particular business guy actually ingests AI into a business process and the AI is actually enabled into the DNA of the organization. So with that data democratization and citizen data scientists with the tools like data robot and all really become relevant here because those guys without even understanding technology can actually be a part of the data analytics and AI and actually be part of the journey uh, and, and what outcomes are getting generated. So that's where I would say, you know, the citizen data scientists and how do you actually democratize the data to build innovations on top so that AI ingested into the DNA and not uh, is perceived as a siloed org uh, will actually come into the play, I guess. So what you're saying is you have to build the buy-in by having them, by having the business folks themselves determine and say, hey, this is where exactly. uh, I can kind of uh, use the AI. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so that that is really interesting. So now, now let me just change tack. You know, you you did say that uh, you gave your example to say recently, uh, whatever you know, uh, credit decisioning rules you may have had in the past uh, may not actually work now because the world has changed a lot, right? We work from home, we, we shop online, even entertainment and etc. is online. So in these times, uh, Mustafa, my question to you: Have you seen whether there are any particular uses of AI or ML that uh, the bank uh, has sort of uh, found? Have they been able to leverage that to either serve your customer a little better or to prevent, you know, any kind of uh, crime that you've seen? Hello, Mr. So far, you're muted. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Arna. Yeah. And uh, coming back to your question, yes, uh, for the, for the banks, yes, is is you know for for this pandemic, like all other areas, uh, the way we work, uh, uh, the way we do things, uh, has been changed and impacted, and uh, bank and banking services are, are no exception. Uh, so. <clears throat> that I mean, the need for digital transformation as a whole. If I if I talk in a broader sense, was always there, was always realized, but probably it has been tremendously expedited, uh, and the need was tremendously realized by the banks as well, uh, especially from the customers' experience perspective as well, where more and more more customers were keen or uh, they were kind of it has become a necessity for them to you know transact or do uh, banking uh, frictionless or without much human inter interaction and also especially for bangladesh market where uh, bank uh, probably for other other industries as well uh, that had to go through some blow in the cost or profitability perspective so cost reduction customer experience and obviously as you mentioned that <clears throat> uh cyber crime related because there was more uh, uh surface for the hackers or uh cyber criminals to you know uh, intrude uh so so the need obviously uh, uh, the bank needed to pace up things to you know digital transformation and ai or machine learning uh, and analytics obviously being a very uh, key vehicles to transform uh, to to first phase the transformation uh, was always uh, there in the bank's uh, priority list. So, uh, for example, for customer experience, uh, uh, bank you know started to incorporate uh, natural language chatbots where natural language processing and other in customer interaction needed to be there. Uh, and uh, a lot of banks in Bangladesh uh, uh, that probably. Uh, uh, was little lying behind in this area. Now pay, pace of things, and they started to implement chatbots. And most of the banks, including my banks, uh, my bank, uh, we implemented chatbot and voicebot. Also, we are exploring, uh, and that's that's from customer experience perspective. And also, this not only from customer experience perspective, from the bank's perspective, the human direction since it it uh, it, it is requiring less involvement. So uh, it is reducing the human involvement, thereby reducing the cost of the bank side. And uh, another cost for cost reduction, probably uh, AI or 
especially ai has other impl uh, implementations like uh, traditional you know uh, application of uh, ai rpa so to automate internal process and uh, you know internal workflows uh, probably where we were progressing a little slower uh, we know obviously that has become a priority suddenly and uh, uh, a lot of process especially some research has shown that it, it uh, probably reduced 20 to up to 30 percent of the cost of the operational cost of the bank if we can you know in areas if we can implement robotic process analytics so uh, from cost perspective obviously that's that's obviously a very attractive uh, implementation for the banks uh, and uh, yes from security perspective as well that 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 mostly driven by you know bank probably they will they, they themselves will not be able to implement but a lot of solution providers they are coming up with uh, this uh, network behavior analytics for example or user or entity behavior analytics or maybe uh, uh, you know uh, uh, fraudulent activity analytics this kind of analytics solution are coming up i mean more faster and uh, uh, that is ha that has become definitely a priority it's certainly i mean that that was a priority before also but now that the surface has expanded uh, so for the banks uh, obviously these are now in the uh, very uh, uh, top priority of the banks okay okay yeah so can i can i ask you then a follow up question mustafa yeah. um, you know you you talked about the fact that ai and ml is definitely beneficial to the and analytics is definitely uh, beneficial you know to the bank um, and in, in in many ways including cost reduction etc do you have any situation where perhaps you try to apply ai or ml and found that you know this is not really the best technology over here maybe you can use something else like an rpa or a uh, you know some other form of uh, automation have you uh, actually seen anything like this in in the bank uh yeah i mean ai and analytics obviously they are awesome technologies they have a lot of applications but you don't need everywhere i mean i mean you need the right use cases for implementing those right because these are uh, uh these needs a lot of uh, computing uh, power and a lot of other resources right so there are areas where probably a simple conventional automation would do the things especially ai uh, require a lot of data if you don't have data if you don't have uh, i mean uh, uh, enough data to analyze or probably you don't need at all the ai because uh, there are aut simple automation simple programs that can do the things right even for rp also you don't need rp everywhere rp is required for uh the where integration uh, application to application integration probably is not open or there is no handshaking mechanism so you need uh to log into some application and do the things rule based things and, and you can do this using the rpa so yeah there are many occasions where uh probably uh, i mean obviously there are uh, use cases where uh, simple automation will do, do the things for ai or especially for machine learning you need uh, a lot of data and then you need, you need uh, uh, over time uh, where the experience and self learning process is there is required and some prediction has to be made uh, on some uncertainty of the future uh, that that type of use cases probably is appropriate for the machine learning uh, uh, especially in areas like uh, where you need to have the self learning like natural language processing or maybe uh, this this fr uh, fraud analysis area where every day new frauds uh, new threats are coming and uh, the system need to learn by themselves okay but lot of areas where you need simple automation workflow automation or many other areas uh, then uh, probably uh, uh, a simple uh, software will do the things for you thank you thank you mustafa so so let me then just take it to to sara Uh, Sarat, just can you give me? I mean, in in your industry, you know, telecommunication industry, 
give give us some indication of any use cases where you've seen a really good ai powered uh, sort of perhaps a business opportunity or uh, you know a uh, 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 sort of fraud avoidance or threat avoidance kind of situation tell us how you've been able to use it effectively in your industry i don't know um more than a telco i'm part of a bank uh, as a oh, oh i'm so sorry so, i thought you were part of the communication no okay that's no. good then uh, tell, us, tell us in the bank yeah yeah sure uh, apologies um, so they definitely yeah. no 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 problem they are uh, we do cl- work very closely with the telco but um, i i think there are a lot more use cases in the banking that uh, we can relate to um, uh, definitely i think uh, see one uh, big advantage of using ai uh, has been in the area of kyc and uh, customer onboarding and simplifying the customer onboarding processes all the way from uh, being able to do uh, video kyc being able to look at um let's say an aadhar or a pan um uh, document extract data out from that through ocr being able to uh, use using an ai uh, system to be able to tell me whether that particular document that's been shown there uh, in a photo is it a fake is it a real um, a lot of these kind of uh, use cases where uh, we've been able to simplify the customer onboarding right without they having to come to a bank branch or even to a nearby retailer that we have um uh, has been possible only because of uh, the ability of ai algorithms in terms of vision in terms of uh, uh, ocr and other kind of uh, capabilities uh i think that is one area the banking and bfsi industry is definitely um um seeing a huge use cases around and customer simplification apart from this uh, for us as a bank um we've been looking at uh, uh, frauds that happen across the board across the industry i think the number of frauds that happen on our own customers is limited but in the industry there are wishing attacks and others on uh, gullible uh, uh, um, uh, customers of other banks and uh, we could possibly be a conduit because it's very easy to create accounts and others a lot of the payment bank accounts uh, or wallets are conduits to frauds this is an area where we invested a lot of time in terms of uh, using ai and ml algorithms to identify various kinds of fraud scenarios where it's not just about business rules but my algorithms are looking at various kinds of transactions that are happening trying to find what are the correlations between different people who are doing these transactions and identifying in near real time uh, if a transaction could be a conduit fraud for example i think uh, uh, over the last 6 months when we've been working closely with uh, the regulators and uh, uh, building these solutions Uh, we've seen that uh, our uh, conduit fraud uh, this numbers have come down drastically uh, we now have them at about uh, 15 to 20% of what it used to be earlier and that wouldn't have happened if uh, we did not leverage some of the ml uh, algorithms as part of our uh, fraud management systems i think that's another area that is very critical the third area where we see a lot of use cases definitely are around um, uh, customer experience right Uh, all of us in the digital age um, know very clearly that customers have multiple options and it is our duty to provide the best service to the customer at the right time it's all about understanding who the customer is understanding what the customer's needs are understanding what is the propensity of the customer to take an action at a particular time and then providing the right kind of nudge at that point in time when the customer is going to take that action i think these four attributes understanding them is very critical for any digital platform for example i have to pay my electricity bill i could be sent multiple notifications as soon as the bill is generated or somewhere near the due uh, due date but i am not going to figure any of these things no, not going to take action because i have a habit i have a behavior if the bill is generated on the 18th and let's say the first of the month next month is the uh, bill due date i could be somebody who says that i'm going to pay the bill as soon as the bill is generated or i could be somebody who is going to say i will pay the bill maybe 3 4 days before the bill date or i could be somebody who could be wanting to pay the bill only on the last day also when although in the covid age this doesn't matter possibly when i'm going back from office to home is when i might want to look at these bills so each of these are specific categories i mean the power of category of one right that's if we want to get to that we have tens of millions of customers 
if i want to be able to understand that customer at that one level and say sharath when he on uh, two days before the bill date when he is going back home in a cab or whatever is when he has the highest propensity to pay the bill understanding it at that level at that granularity is something that is humanly un, um, uh, impossible and this is where again you have to invest in ml algorithms and others to be able to create that category of one and provide the most personalized experience to those customers and this i think is the crux of uh, being in the digital space right uh, being uh, able to understand the customer and deliver the right service to the customer when they want it and they need it um, i think right. that's another space where all of us in the digital space are seeing uh, huge usage of ai and ml right uh, right sir. apart from this i think video bots and uh, uh, chat bots voice bots uh, is very critical for us i'll just take one sec um, a few minutes a few seconds for this voice uh, we believe is a very strong uh, uh, enabler for the next uh, few this thing we target not the top uh, 300 million of uh, uh, india but the second or maybe even the third for them they are not going to work with applications and read the text on the applications uh, so even if you make it uh, vernacular i don't think it is really effective to get to the customers that we are talking to as payments banks uh, not just us but all the payment bank community uh we have to start investing in voice and that to in so many dialects of voice um and languages uh, that is a challenge and but i think that is the next enabler for a huge digital adoption across india thank you sarath i think that was very very interesting and like you said the whole thing is about customer experience you know we need to know what he wants when he wants which location he wants and depending on his mood so that's that's only when you have actually got your segment so so very interesting um thank you uh, so now now i'm going to get back to uh, rupreet uh, rupreet see we we heard all of these use cases each of them tend to be fairly complex there is a business aspect of it there's a technology aspect of it the data science aspect of it uh perhaps a compliance one if you're talking about customer onboarding and all of that stuff so lots of different skills lots of different people what in your view is the best structure of of a project that will enable the team to really execute an ai ml um you know solution very effectively just give us uh, you know your your thoughts on this well thank you runa again uh, uh, a great question because uh i strongly believe that uh, when you want to define an org chart let's say for a, a you know for ai um it's actually very much dependent on what an organization defines um, a data strategy as okay so uh, the first level i would say uh, the data strategy and vision needs to be very specific and very clear and that will actually define the org strategy so that is first level the second is i actually you know i'm um uh, for a large enterprise with a lot of service lines uh you know i propose a hub and a spoke model so what i meant by that is hub actually which is a centralized org then the, you know it will actually cater to all of the common services so which is data management services data governance data standardized data standards right and uh, the platform engineering on which you will actually build your ml algorithms the pipelines and all of those so basically the engineering and the infrastructure Uh, the risk and compliance the trust services and all of those but the spoke uh, this is very critical because the there are, if there are multitude of service line every service lines will actually have their own businesses and their own relevant data strategy which will actually tie up with an org level data strategy right they should at the spoke level they should define an ai product manager and you know applied scientists i would say you know applied data scientists who are much closer to the real life business applications of the service line okay so that's where it's a mix and match of what you want to actually bring from a common methodology from a base layer and what do you actually you know want to actually innovate for that particular service line so it's a hub and, hub and spoke model that actually moves together but saying that i also want to actually give you a thought process that uh the data democratization okay uh, as i all also mentioned in the uh, in the previous question is very relevant here just creating an org chart won't actually suffice people need to actually understand how to actually ingest ai and how to think about ai when they are actually dealing with their business processes and for that two elements are very important first is how do you actually 
democratize your data to actually all of the service line to everyone in the org how do you how does your actually engineering platform caters to that in a very trusted format and second is how a novice who has no actually understanding about technology okay becomes like a citizen data scientist and uses those and models okay and uses the system to actually innovate on top so enablement function with the hub and spoke plus how the technology is actually serving this is uh, are all the factors that are very critical to define an org chart i would say Great. thank you very insightful repeat i i think that's something that's the reason why we have to keep talking about you know ai and ml implementation we have to just keep learning what works and what does not work very very useful and i think there are a number of other challenges also other than the org chart um so one of them i think uh, you know i'm going to just uh, we're sort of going to have to manage the time a little bit so i am going to now move to uh, mustafa and i'm going to ask you see one of the aspects of uh, ai ml we've all been talking about is that you need really large amounts of data and data means you need to be able to store all of it you need uh, machines to be able to crunch it to be able to do the compute on it and given the restrictions of uh, or constraints of on prem data centers and the promise of you know unlimited scalable infrastructure in the cloud uh, that seems to be the cloud is is really an answer to most of our big data ai ml kind of implementations uh, would you agree or or do you see things differently especially from the bank and let me add from the banking uh, industry perspective what's your thoughts on it You're on mute, Mustafa. Sorry, I'm repeatedly doing this mistake. That's yes, okay. sorry That's for okay. that. That's uh, yes, banking, bank being the probably most regulated industry. That's that. Uh, that's a question. That's a good question. I mean, uh, but obviously, I think that is the answer. Ultimately, yes, bank. Uh, given the volume that we need for doing real analysis. implementing machine learning or deep learning uh, that kind of volume that that uh, now you know uh, more and more data uh, coming up so i mean with the all the digital services and all internet of things where consumers are using lot of devices interconnected devices we will have lot of data structured and structured unsupervised data and this the given the volume there obviously you know on prem where you cannot predict uh, the level of scalability you need obviously cloud has to be the answer okay and uh, uh, maybe our i can tell about bangladesh market that we from regulators perspective also uh, need to look at this because we have some regulatory constraints right now we cannot you know take everything to the cloud but um there are some gray areas as well that that need to be mitigated and that has to be there has to be clear guideline and policies for that uh, to you know uh, remove those gray areas uh, but that is the that is the ultimate answer that is the ultimate answer and uh, probably we can survive for several more years but eventually uh, if we want to do appropriate uh, uh, prediction analysis and then uh for for the lot of the use cases that also sharad was mentioning uh for uh you know uh, credit decisions for marketing personalized marketing or customer segmentation or customer classification all those data over the internet or was the digital uh, you know space uh, that volume you cannot contain in your own premise premise right so uh you need to go ultimately to the cloud where the scalability and flexibility will be there and uh, going forward maybe within the next few years or so that will become a necessity that's what is my understanding thank you thank you mustafa so since you also represent a bank just very quickly do you have the same view that uh, you know cloud is going to be the, the uh, eventual implementing grounds for all uh, ml and ai solutions um uh, i don't know i think uh, uh, cloud uh, the way i look at it is cloud is a technology uh, platform um, and secondly cloud as a 
a bunch of service providers who provide uh, um, uh, these uh, cloud services. The way we look at it is even in our own private cloud infrastructure, right? We use cloud technologies. We use um, uh, virtualization, sure, sure. containerization, sure, sure. and other of these things. Yeah. So in the context that we have a lot of uh, confidential data and we have to be very responsible for uh, customer data, uh, we do use cloud technologies within our own um, data centers. Uh, and that is extremely critical for effective utilization and uh, stuff. But hybrid cloud also becomes a useful use case for a lot of us. But I think there is a lot more care we have to take uh, about uh, leveraging hybrid cloud. Uh, there are regulatory aspects around it. Uh, we need to also ensure that the cloud providers are providing enough security and um, uh, care about how we are able to manage our data in a public or a hybrid cloud situation if we ever get to that. I mean, for example, uh, while it is given, while most of the cloud providers would give us assurance that they do not look at our data and other stuff, I think unless we get surety that the data that is stored there is encrypted, encrypted with our keys, which are only with us and stuff like that. Uh, a rampant usage of uh, public cloud for uh, industry like uh, banking might be very restrictive. But equivalent technologies used in our own uh, data centers, I think, is uh, definitely something that we see uh, and we do use already. A lot of our machine learning algorithms, um, when they're doing um, heightened uh, uh, data crunching, uh, we definitely use auto scaling kind of capabilities and we i think the whole industry uses some of them at some level or the other uh, the second is uh, in terms of a hybrid cloud where some of my resources are on a cloud in, internal cloud platform but i use um, hybrid cloud from a independent uh, cloud provider um, i think a whole bunch of uh, what shall i say filters which will uh, um, uh, do the data munging clean up of the data um, all those are something that are very critical to use. And um, without those, I don't think um, external cloud solutions are something that we will get to in the near, um, in a rush. I think there's a lot of regulatory and uh, security concerns around how we leverage these. So I would think cloud technologies internally are absolutely fine. When it comes to hybrid, uh, there are a lot of concerns there um, and um, we need to tread carefully. Aruna, you're on mute. So you see, I did that too. Okay. So uh, the question to you is, you know, on the data privacy, whether it's in your own data center or whether it's in a public cloud, uh, given the expected data privacy, uh, the, the bill if you're soon going to law, do you see concerns for some of the solutions that we are all implementing for AI, uh, ML, analytics, do you see you know, a, a specific, uh, more uh, heightened concern around there? Well, the, uh, absolutely yes, Saruna. Okay, this, this is a very vast subject. Okay, so it's, it actually goes beyond data privacy. It goes to regional level data laws, okay, uh, data sovereignty and, uh, and all those kind of issues also. Yeah, it's absolutely, you know, there are certain concerns and uh, uh, we are adhering both, uh, you know, with all of the model, basically people process and technology model. Uh, but actually to go deeper into this, I'll, I'll actually explain uh, the trust first. Okay, so uh, what what do you mean by how do you actually trust a data element? And so if, if we understand that, then we understand what are the different levels and regulations that we need to actually adhere to. Uh, when a data comes to an enterprise, okay, how do you actually trust that data? That is the first point. And second is how do you actually use the data? So which is the output? If both of the you know, levers are corrected and regulated uh, within an enterprise in a certain way, then I think we are we are sorted. Okay. <laughs> this is very simple definition of the trust. In order to do this, okay, and actually India has also come up with the uh, data uh, you know protection privacy law last year they have introduced into parliament. Okay, so it's going on right now. So an enterprise, basically, they need to develop a trust framework, okay? And when I say trust is basically catering to how do you actually, uh, you know, uh, reduce the risk of data privacy from a personal data perspective, right? right? If an enterprise is at a globally scale, every region has their own data laws. And there are, of course, countries like Russia, 
who are like red box countries okay so anything that you do with the personal data needs to be there within the russian data centers right so all of those things if you can enterprise at a global level they need to cater to so the first element is the trust framework we need to build a trust framework which caters to you know country level laws uh, confidentiality customer you know if i say that okay, i am the customer and giving the data to a bank i don't want you to actually pass the data further or analyze my data all those kind of customer laws will also ingest it now the second important point is create a data fabric okay and when you do that okay you you know you automatically ingest the trust with all of these uh, uh, you know the engineering that we are doing if those couple of points are sorted i think uh, the trust policies data risk and operation compliant those areas um, will become very critical in the fabric ecosystem to enforce the policies so that there is no risk with respect to privacy law laws infringement and all of those so that's where i come to i mean we enterprise has to invest into a trust uh, trust framework and to a platform Uh, which is data fabric uh, where anything that you know and everything that we do on uh, with respect to data we can actually trust and we are sure that there is no risk um, uh, that we are adhering to thank you very very useful okay i'd like to so, add for a few seconds here that when it yeah, talk yeah. about Let, taking things in the cloud yeah so yeah please it doesn't mean yeah. that uh, i mean uh, confidentiality and control has to be compromised Right. Uh, I agree. It can be a shared responsibility with the cloud provider, and, and obviously uh, there some kind of improvement or that evolution that is going on uh, that uh, need to give us that kind of trust that, uh, for, especially for the banking industry, that okay we can move uh, to cloud or it can be a hybrid solution as well as uh, Sharad was mentioning. Uh, yes, obviously that uh, uh, that is, uh, has to be there. Okay. and uh, uh, if that is ensured and and right now also uh, probably everything we cannot take it to the cloud there has to be some rational or judgmental call as well that what you can take to cloud what you cannot so that kind of trust has to as rupit was also mentioning uh, that this confidence and this uh, uh, you know assurance uh, uh, confidence need to be given from the uh cloud service providers side as well before bank uh, being very sensitive organization can take the decision but uh, anyway you need to probably in some point of time when these things will be in place uh, probably uh, it will be a necessity uh, if not full at least in hybrid model that has to be there thank you thank you mustafa that's good so uh, now we are running out of time so i am going to ask oh and uh, maybe we lost visual on mr oh you're back okay good uh, all right so since we're running out of time i am i'm now coming down to the last question and this is to sarat sarat if you had to sort of give a pointed one minute sort of counsel to all of those professionals who are implementing ai and ml for the first time what would you like to tell them what would you what benefit of your experience would you, would you provide um i think we talked about this earlier too um whenever we find a new tool it's always uh, as engineers as uh, business people it is very common for us to start uh looking at every problem as a problem that uh needs this particular solution i think right. uh, we shouldn't get carried away i mm -hmm. think all of us at least i would have um, uh, uh gone through that uh, excitement saying that okay i know this new tool so i'm going to use this for everything but that i think is something that we should be careful about a lot of times something else might be a very well uh, meaning and uh, effective solution to what uh, the problem is without having to use some of these latest technologies second is uh we need to ensure that these technologies are not used in a silo i mean a very very uh, easily new organizations tend to create a data science organization and then says okay any problem that is related to a machine learning or ai is going to be done in this particular organization i think that uh, model uh, although it was uh, very common in the past uh, I, at least i am seeing that within my own organization and otherwise 
uh, see that that model doesn't necessarily work very well. Keeping a team on a ivory tower and saying they are going to solve all our problems does not happen. And I think uh, uh, Rupreet uh, mentioned a hub and spoke, right? It is that's how we set ourselves too. We have a data science team, but the expectation is that their uh, role is to evangelize machine learning and data sciences through the whole organization. And that evangelization and training is extremely critical. Uh, and that is one of their KRAs. The uh, doing it this way ensures that everybody starts thinking about ML and other uh, alternatives to finding solutions. Um, at least for me, it is also an enablement of this data science team that now they can focus on more evolved problems rather than just using standard basic ML algorithms on stuff. So I think that's the third one um, that I would look for. And finally, the fourth one is um, experiment, fail fast, and learn. Uh, especially machine learning is all about that, right? Feed very short feedback loops. But as a culture, we should move to an organization which is more based on it's OK to try something, fail, take that feedback, relearn, and keep on improving. I think that cultural aspect, of um, which is the core thing of science itself, right? that uh, uh, scientific behavior and rigor is something that uh, we should allow in the organizations. They're not going to be silver bullets. They're not going to be uh, a quick fix that will just come out of the blue just like that. Uh, we need to give these teams the time as management. We need to give them the time to experiment, come up with results, uh, and keep on improving it. I think these are some of the things that I have experienced myself and seen others whom I have coached or mentored uh, get into challenges with. Thank you, Sarah. A lot of wisdom in, in squeezed into one minute. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to just uh, sort of summarize, you know, some of the nuggets of uh, sort of wisdom that we've all you know, sort of curated in this in this uh, call um, and, and then hand it back to Jeevan. So so the first thing we talked about is what is AI, ML? Is it really uh, a, a transparent algorithm or a black box and uh, Sarah just defined for us that it can be an ML based algorithm that a human being uh, provides to the system or it could be something where you give the data and the AI itself builds the algorithm and the there needs to be a balance on whether we are going to have it completely transparent or uh, you know with with enough human intervention but we have to be careful about the bias that that might bring in. So we have to balance uh, all of that off. Then when we talked about leveraging it, I think probably one of the greatest insights was that if you really want to have adoption, because you can implement it, but if you really want to have adoption, you need to have the citizen data scientists where the practitioners of the business and the operations themselves give us problems that they would like to have resolved in the machine language so that they are happy to adopt what the, the results that come out. And uh, some of the areas that we have, we have seen it being implemented quite successfully is in a customer auth uh, authentication, bringing onboarding customers is one area. Uh, I think we also talked about the fact that uh, fraud, uh, fraud prevention, pattern detection of fraud seems to be something that is fairly widely used. I think both Mustafa and Sarah talked about that. And uh, then we talked about customer experience. That That is the holy grail, you know, and only machine language and AI can really help us understand what the customer wants at that particular instant of time. In terms of data protection and, and privacy, we talked about the need for building a trust framework, uh, uh, you know, which will first define what is going to be your data science strategy and then build your sort of uh, trust framework for it the organization first and then the trust framework for it and invest in a good data framework um, sort of platform which is going to uh, facilitate all of this eventually the wisdom is don't build it in silos um, enable your organization to to if, uh, sort of learn fast, fail if necessary, and, and continue to move, move on. So a very interesting uh, sort of uh, technology that, that we have uh, you know, available to us, and we really need to get better and better at leverage and uh, sort of uh, benefiting from it. So I, I think uh, very useful for me. Uh, thank you. I, I thank the panelists, and the experience comes through in, in all of your uh, answers and the questions that you raise. 
And uh, with this, I would like to give it back to Jeevan.